Hi everyone, and welcome to our second video in our series of explaining solid state physics in terms that are more natural to a chemist. And in particular, uh, today we're going to be talking, continuing our discussion of the tight binding approximation, which is using an orbital approach to discuss band structures and wave functions in solid state physics. And the topic of this lecture is going to be how orbitals lead to band structure and moving beyond uh, what we talked about in the last lecture, which was only S-type orbitals. So before we get going too far, let's review some of the key facts from the last lecture. Uh, remember in the last lecture we had a line of uh, different atoms and on each atom we had an s orbital and we made a block wave out of them. Or in other words, we gave our wave function some crystal momentum, a spatially dependent phase factor. And there were two special points that we were looking at. We looked at the gamma point, the point where there's no crystal momentum, k is equal to zero. And for an s orbital, what we found was that the wave functions, <clears throat> the orbitals in that wave function add together constructively. All right, so if we here we have this graph, we want to look at this graphically. Here we have three atoms in a line. On the middle atom, I'm going to place an s orbital. I'm going to place an s orbital on its neighbor uh, to the right. And then I'm going to make a wave function out of that, and they're going to add together constructively. Right, so there's uh, extra electron density, extra electron sharing in the middle, like uh, there's no node, so there's a minimum in kinetic energy, uh, and this ended up being a minimum in the energy structure. Okay, now let's contrast that with the Brion zone edge, right? The, 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 the boundary of the Brion zone, when we have maximum crystal momentum in our system. So if it's zero crystal momentum, we get the electrons all adding together in phase with the orbitals. Uh, at maximum crystal momentum, we get them adding perfectly out of phase. So at k, so at uh, crystal momentum equal to pi over a, or a wavelength of uh, twice uh, <clears throat> twice the the bond length, uh, we're going to have if we have a, a positive s orbital on the atom in the middle, then its neighbor to either side is going to be 180 degrees out of that phase factor of pi. Uh, so if the one in the middle is positive, then its two neighbors are going to be negative. That's going to give us a node on either side of our atom in the middle. That's going to have a higher energy than what we have at zero and what we had at zero crystal momentum where there's no nodes. And we get a, a, a band structure that rises as we increase our crystal momentum. So this very prototypical cosine band. And that's sort of what we talked about last time. Right? So we have uh, on the constructive interference at gamma, we have no node. Uh, at the, the x point, the Brion zone boundary, we have a node at pi over a. We have a node between every atom, and that's the highest energy state we can have. Okay. The last thing that I wanted to talk about, be, briefly touch on here, is that that transfer integral, right? We said that our Hamiltonian is going to connect one atom to its nearest neighbor. Uh, that transfer integral T does not depend on the crystal momentum. It's independent of the crystal momentum. But it does, however, depend on the distance between two atoms. Right? So if we take our linear chain of atoms and we make them infinitely far apart, our Hamiltonian shouldn't be able to connect one atom to the next. And so that transfer atom, that transfer integral t is effectively going to be zero. Okay? If we smoosh them all the way together, right, so they're on top of each other, then the electrons should all repel each other and the nuclei should all repel each other. Uh, and we should effectively have a, an infinite transfer integral. But remember, we're going to have, we have the sign convention. That's actually going to be negative. So a negative transfer integral is going to lead to a repulsive interaction. And then at some point, our transfer integral is going to maximize, right? So in this diagram that we show here, we have that maximum being around one and a half bore. Um, that's sort of an arbitrary number. It obviously will depend on which atoms you have and how well the, the, their wave functions overlap. Uh, but at some point, that transfer integral will maximize, uh, <clears throat> and that will, will, will give us our most stable bonding point. Okay, so transfer integral, positive transfer integrals lead to uh, more electron sharing or, or, or orbital sharing. Uh, negative transfer integrals are going to lead to repulsive interactions. Okay. All right, so that was for our line of, of atoms with only s orbitals. But what happens if our orbital isn't an s orbital, right? What if we have a p orbital or a d orbital? Uh, 
We're going to walk through an example here where we have p orbitals, and then I'll ask you what happens if you have a d orbital. Okay, so let's start with p orbitals. There are obviously three p orbitals. We can have px, py, and pz, and so we need to make a coordinate assignment here. We're going to have our atoms all be aligned on the x-axis. Okay, and so what we need to distinguish pz and py are going to look pretty similar. Right, so let's look at pz first. This is the pz orbital. So remember, pz orbital has a node at z is equal to zero. Okay, uh, so we're going to have maybe a, a positive phase above, and our wave function might be negative below. And so this is what it would look like at the gamma point, where they're all adding together in phase. Uh, so this is a, a, a pz orbital on each atom. Let's contrast that with how that looks for px orbitals. If I have my px orbitals, right, now if I look at the atom here over here on the left, right, I have negative on the, the left and positive. On, I have a, a red on one side and blue on the other. And then I go to my next atom. I still have red on one side, blue on the other. I go to the next atom, and I have red on one side and blue on the other. Right? I'm just placing a copy of that px orbital pointing in the same direction with the same phase on each individual atom, right? So that's my px orbital. We're going to call blue is positive, red is negative. So we have negative positive, negative positive, negative positive. Okay. Now let's look at the consequence of changing these orbitals and importantly changing the symmetry of these orbitals. We're going to do the exact same math that we did for the chain of s, atom, uh, s orbitals. So I'm not going to go through it in as much detail as the last video. But we're going to start with a block wave function. It was going to be a wave function that's going to be labeled by some crystal momentum k. And so we're going to be summing over each lattice site with a phase factor e to the i k x times in a p orbital centered uh, at each atom. We're then going to calculate the matrix element of the Hamiltonian acting on our wave function, so h acting on psi. And then we're going to project that back onto one of the orbitals centered at the origin. Remember, each of the orbitals, each individual unit cell has to be the same as its neighbors, has to contribute the same amount. So if we know what the energy contribution of a single unit cell is, then we can just multiply that by capital N, the total number of unit cells we have in our crystal, and the total energy of the system. So we really only need to worry about the, the energy per unit cell. And so I've written this down here in Schrodinger notation and sort of a wave function notation as well as a uh, Dirac notation, whichever one you're more familiar with. And then here's the key part, right? So we're doing a tight binding approximation. We're only going to let our Hamiltonian connect atoms, one atom to its nearest neighbor on either side. And it's not going to connect an atom, in the, an atom to, to an atom two neighbors down. Right? So we're only going to have one transfer integral. And when we work through that math, we're going to get that our energy or our dispersion relationship is going to be the energy of our p orbital minus 2 times the transfer integral times cosine kx. Right? And k is going to run from minus pi over a to pi over a. We have uh, <clears throat> our, in, a, in a linear chain of atoms, we really only need to worry about how it goes from 0 to pi over a because we have inverse symmetry, but that's, that's just a detail. Um, but this is our, our, our dispersion relation, just like it was for the s orbitals. But now our transfer integral is going to be different, right? Our wave functions are going to overlap differently, have a different amount of overlap uh, and a different spatial extent uh, if they're pz orbitals or px orbitals than if, they're, than, than if they're s orbitals. And in fact, they might even be different between the pz and the px. So let's take a look at this. And we're going to start by looking at our pz orbital. So here we have this is the same type of video we showed last time in the same exact format, right? So we have in the upper left quadrant, we have uh, the real part of our wave function. In the bottom left quadrant, we have the imaginary portion of our wave function. On the lower right quadrant, we have the density, right? So that's psi squared, the magnitude of psi squared. And then in our upper right-hand quadrant, we have our energy as a function of k. And what we're going to do in this video is we're going to step through different crystal momentum points. We're going to step through k. All right, so let's take a look at this. Right, so k is increasing 
We started with a no we started with no nodes between each atom. And as we do, we can see we get this cosine band, the energy rises. And as we look at the real part of our wave function, by the time we get to the boson boundary of pi over a, every other neighbor is completely every other atom is completely out of phase with its neighbor. Right? And when we look in our density, we can see that we now have a, a node, not just in the plane at z equals zero, but we have a full node between each atom in the x direction. Maybe we can watch this one more time, right? So at intermediate k, low k, whoop, there we go. So at 0 k, they're all adding up together. There's no nodes in the x direction. And by the time we get to the zone boundary, we have nodes between each atom. Now let's look at the px orbital. Remember, in the px orbital, we're just we're just adding and copying that same p orbital on one atom and the next one and the next one at the gamma point, right? There's no, no phase factor there. And when we look at this, now we have a node at the center of each atom, right? But we also have a node in between each atom. So we can see that in the real portion of the wave function, and we can see that in our density plot. So at k is equal to 0, we actually have a lot of nodes, and so we have a maximum energy. As we increase momentum, whoop, go back. As we increase k, we can see how the wave function is changing. We have a multiplying it by this plane wave, and our energy is going down because we're decreasing the number of nodes. And when we get to pi over a, we have actually decreased the number of nodes by half. So now we have basically electron sharing between each pair of atoms. Okay. So e, our dispersion relationship looks the opposite of the s orbitals. It goes down in energy. We'll play this one more time. Right. Our energy goes down as we increase our crystal momentum. And the reason for this is that we're decreasing the number of nodes. And that has to do with the different symmetry of the px orbitals versus the, the s orbitals along the x direction. Okay. All right. So for both the px and the pz orbitals, the dispersion relation of the associated bands looks the same, has the same mathematical form. Energy of a p orbital minus twice the transfer integral times the cosine function of k, but the sine of t changes. So we have a positive t for our pz orbital, so they're going to look this, going to have the same shape. Whoops, sorry, same shape as our s orbitals did, but our transfer integral is negative for px. So it actually, we have to increase our crystal momentum to get more of a bonding interaction. And then finally, its magnitude will be different. We didn't really show the magnitude, but it in principle can be different, and which one's going to be lower will depend on some of the details, the chemical details of the interactions. Uh, and the distance dependence will be different, right? The pz orbitals are going to overlap less then the px orbitals, which are pointed right at each other, right? So we have pi bonds in the pz orbitals and sigma bonds in the px. And so the questions that hopefully you might be able to answer for this uh, is, let's start simple. What would the dispersion and wave functions for a linear chain of py orbitals look like? Would that look more like the pz orbitals or the px orbitals? And now we can answer a little bit more difficult question, which is how do you think the d orbitals would look? If we had an atomic chain that only had d orbitals, what would the dispersion relationship look like if we had a dz squared orbital, or a dxy, or a dyz? Okay. And with that, uh, we'll stop this video, uh, tune into the next one, and we will talk about uh, how to extend the tight binding approximation to having, in two different ways, having multiple orbitals on an individual atom or having multiple atoms within a unit cell. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video.